Ag careers and farming with a paycheck. You picked a good one to come to. I gotta give you a high sign when we move this. Okay. The panel purpose is to provide guidance to veterans who might be interested in ag career other than full-time farming on their own, and to provide guidance to veterans who might want to farm but also want to supplement their income with an agricultural job. We got a great panelist here. All of us are not involved in production agriculture, yet we've had careers in agriculture that we've loved. So th this will be a, a great one, and I'm going to let them self-introduce. But to start with, this isn't a girl-boy thing here. But I got Ivory Harlow is going first, and Anna Mann. Ivory's from Chillicothe, Ohio. Anna's from the faraway place of Washington, D.C. Matt McHugh from McMinnville, Oregon. Adam Saborn from Visalia, California, and I'm Len Monaco from Woodland, California. So without further ado, Ivory, you're on. Hi, everyone. My name is Ivory Harlow. I am a U.S. Air Force veteran. Go to my first slide. Um, I'm a U.S. Air Force veteran. I am the chief farmerette of Dickie Bird Farm. We are in southern Ohio. And I'm also the organization director for the Ohio Farm Bureau. So I am here... Um, to talk about how I moved from there to there to there. Um, my husband and I own and operate Dickey Bird Farm. We spent about 10 years in Texas, um, stationed in the military, and when we completed our service, we bought our farm in Ohio. Um, so we started, we both came from rural backgrounds. About 40% of folks in the military do come from rural backgrounds. I grew up on an agritourism operation in Minnesota. Um, my husband is from a little town called Lano, not far from here. Um, I grew up on a horse farm, horse boarding, um, also pony parties, um, that sort of thing. My husband came from a hog operation, which in the late 80s, when that market fell out, transitioned to cattle. So the 10 years we spent on military bases, we knew we wanted to farm. It was always the end goal. Um, started saving money and creating our big dream to do that. We were able to start our farm in 2012. So we completed our military service and bought our farm, which is Dickie Bird Farm. So we are we have a cow-calf operation. We raise free-range laying hens. Everything is grass-fed. We also have uh, meat goats, which are boar goats there you see in the picture. Uh, we have a hay enterprise. And we found a niche marketing game birds. So we raise ring-neck pheasants, um, bobwhite quail, and partridge as well. Um, our farm has really been a labor of love for us. Uh, we found great success doing direct-to-consumer sales. So a lot of you in the room may be wondering how you can start this out. If you sat in on the other panels, you may have heard about the intense capital investment that it takes to start a farm. Um, we started on rented land. So all of our production was done on rented land. We made our first land purchase about four years after starting our farm. So it was a great success for us. We still farm on rented land, um, but now we own some property as well. <coughs> So I'm also the organization director for the Ohio Farm Bureau. Is anyone in the room a Farm Bureau member? Great. It's good to see that. So there are Farm Bureaus in every state. As organization director, uh, we are a grassroots organization. My job is to advocate on behalf of farmers um, and also strengthen rural communities. So the programs that we put on are to help you do your job better as farmers. Um, there's clearly a lot of overlap in what I do from 9 to 5 to 5 to 9 at night. Next slide. Um, but it, here, what I'd like you to take away from farming with a paycheck is it's going to benefit you in four ways. Um, access to capital. So lenders love to see off-farm income on those applications. It's incredibly beneficial to be able to leverage off-farm income. Second, it's for the benefits. So health care, um, tuition assistance, right? Um, eye, dental, different benefits, 401ks, um, things we don't have access to as self-employed is something you can do with, with your off-farm income. Skills. So I recently had uh, 
professional program with NRCS and learned a little bit about their conservation programs. Um, I mentioned that we raise game birds, learned a lot about habitat and establishing uh, game bird habitat and put those to practice on my farm. We've grown that operation, doubled the size of that operation in the past few years because of skills I learned on the job. It wasn't something that I necessarily thought we'd ever be in the game bird business, um, but it was something that worked out great for us and it was a skill that I learned on my job. And last but not least, the network. So I work with thousands of farmers across Ohio every day. Um, I have met some fantastic mentors and some fantastic folks that have really helped me build my business. Thank you, Ivory. One thing I neglected to do is to lay out the format. Each presenter here will do their presentation, then we'll do Q&A afterwards, if that's all right. And Ivory, I don't know if you said that, so you're an Air Force veteran, right? And Anna's next, she's an Army veteran. You're on. Yeah, I need sunglasses. All right, so you have to excuse me. I'm losing my voice a little bit. So um, anyway, so my name is Anna Mann. I've actually been with Farmer Veteran Coalition for a really long time. I was one of the first women to get a grant through Farmer Veteran Coalition. Um, and I've been a part of the sort of various women's groups in vet Farmer Veteran Coalition for a long time. Um, so when they asked me to come and speak for this, uh, I you know, sort of spoke to my job about whether I, you know, could take the time, be reimbursed and everything. It's the government, so there's a lot of complications. But in the end, as I was saying earlier, if Michael O'Gorman called me and asked me for help robbing a bank, I would agree and I would come along. So I'm here as a private citizen on my own dime um, so I can speak candidly about our, our friends at USDA. I'm not with those guys. I just want to make that one point clear. Um, so go ahead. So just to lay out exactly how far from them I am, um, I am down there. <clears throat> I'm an international program specialist <clears throat> under a program called Food for Progress. I manage a portfolio of programs, primarily in Eastern Africa and in Asia, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, you know, we sort of a lot of the people at the panel earlier, they work all the way kind of up there to the left, and I'm down here at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> that being said, I love my job, and so I'm here to talk specifically about having a job that is all about farmers and all about agriculture, and in a weird way, also about former war fighters, um, but not actually farming. So, you know, that's me, that's Army. I was in the Army for eight years. Um, did a variety of exciting tours that, I mean, we've all heard the stories, I'm not gonna get too much into that. When I got out of the military though, go ahead, next slide. When I got out of the military, um, I wasn't too sure what I was gonna do with myself. And my husband and I started this small farming operation called Chestnut, Chestnut Ridge Farm in North Carolina. Um, it really helped me find my path forward. Farming um, is, a, is a real tool to help veterans who are struggling with adjusting into civilian life, as we heard at lunch, um, to really find a new identity and find a new path forward. And the Farmer Veteran Coalition was the first place that really believed in me enough to give me a grant and to help me uh, build some of those fences you see there. Um, and then in 2015, I got word from Uncle Sam that if you would like to go ahead and get a master's degree, uh, we will pay for that, but you do have to start now. So I picked up my family and we moved to California and I got a master's degree in international development, which circled me back to what I did in the military. So the next slide. So roughly what I do now, I probably have the luckiest job you can imagine. Who here has ever worked for a nonprofit or ever had to request for a grant or request for money through a grants program or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. I'm the money now. I, I can't tell you how great it is to be on the other side of that table. I highly recommend it as a, as a career. Um, the picture on the left there is me in Nepal. The picture on the bottom right there is me in the Congo uh, in the DRC. Let's go to the next slide there. And then this is me in 
at a yogurt factory. I, I got y'all paid for me to go and taste yogurt in Mozambique. It was awesome. Um, and then in Ethiopia. So here's what I do. I work in Washington, D.C. I work for the Foreign Agriculture Service. Um, I think the best way to sum up the impact that I have and the reason that, that it, it gives me as much meaning as what I've done before is this. So that's that yogurt there in Mozambique. I go and I check on y'all's money. <clears throat> I go and I see how the money's being spent. I evaluate the programs. I make sure that things are going smoothly, that they're doing what they told us they would do uh, in a timely manner. I'm, I'm harsh. I have been known to cut projects off. Uh, I have been known to give projects more money. We were in, a, um, in an intersection uh, in Mozambique outside of Barra, which is where a big cyclone came through. And there are little stalls that are kind of like the corner store, but they're, they're a tiny stall. They're, they're no bigger than one of these tables. It's like a little booth. And I was there because I needed to see the whole value chain for this dairy project we were funding. And I met a guy who was a, um, a former fighter in the conflict in Congo. And he got sick of it, and he left. And he came to Mozambique, and he had nothing. And he was, he was one of us, right? So this, this is a veteran. This is a guy who got out of the war, got away, and just couldn't, couldn't figure out what to do. And he had this little, this little baraka, this little store. And our yogurt guys reached out to them as a community and gave them their little coolers that have the logo of our yogurt company on it. They give them a little cooler, and he sells yogurt now as part of his, you know, he sells like phone cards and, you know, all the usual things. Um, <clears throat> so he sells our yogurt, or he sells his yogurt that comes from the grant that I, <clears throat> the grant that I approved that y'all paid for all the way through from, from this former warfighter who needed help adjusting all the way through to this former warfighter who needed adjusting thousands of miles away. And for me, that is that really sums up what public service is. There's a lot of things going on with USDA, and a lot of those complaints are, are valid. Um, but some of the work that we do in the world is as important and as honorable as anything that I did in uniform. And so I strongly encourage veterans, in particular veterans who've deployed a lot, to consider coming into public service, to consider working in the various foreign services especially. Because when we have problems, when I have problems with my projects, inevitably, you know, my people around me are, are sort of panicking about whatever. I'm a veteran. It doesn't even crack my top 10 of things that I worry about. And that kind of mindset is something that we need in the government. We need in the foreign service. We need people for whom having to wait a half hour to get through a checkpoint and then having you know to sort of deal with various government officials and militaries that that's not a big deal for us you know that that's not going to unnerve us or make us nervous we really uh, are almost best suited for this kind of work so i would strongly encourage i've got my business card i've got my contact information with farmer veteran coalition please reach out to me if you're ever considering working for the government for the foreign service especially um, i would love to talk to you I really think that there's already a lot of veterans that work in my office, but I would like to see more. So please uh, reach out to me for that. Next slide. And that's, <laughs> that's me in a banana operation there in, uh, in Malawi. And that is the um, part of the headwaters of the Nile. And because I was stuck for a long weekend, I actually got to spend a weekend sitting right there in a little cabin overlooking the Nile. So there are perks too, aside from you know, just the paycheck. I got to introduce Matt McHugh. He is member number 001 of Farmer Veteran Coalition. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I'm gonna we're gonna run through this pretty. Uh, I got a lot of picture slides, uh, but there's two things I want you guys to get out of this. First is how to develop your resume and increase your options within the agricultural sector. And the second is to show you a bunch of pictures of myself. <laughs> Go ahead. 
All right, back it up one. All right, that's me and my wonderful wife, Lily Schneider, probably questioning her decision to end up in a relationship with me at that point. Uh, that's on our farm in Fairfield, uh, and so I'll get into that. Next slide. Uh, started out in Iraq. Uh, I'm from the suburbs uh, in Albuquerque, so the first, my first real contact with agriculture was in Iraq, and we had just uh, actually arrested every, every male 16 and older, uh, and we borrowed their house for a little while. We found these great chicken books. It's me and my buddy Manuel Moreno uh, checking out the chickens, and then we were cruising through chicken coops looking for weapons. Uh, all I found was chicken shit out there, but, you know, what can I say? Next slide. I developed a, a real personal relationship with agriculture out there. Uh, <laughs> so I became inspired by agriculture. Next slide. So in between then, I got out of the army, uh, and then I went to a uh, basically an agricultural cult slash uh, uh, UC Santa Cruz program uh, called the Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems. And the main thing, here's the first pillar of getting into this stuff. Uh, it, to get experience, right, a lot of times to get in that, your foot in the door, you need some kind of education. That doesn't necessarily need to be like a four-year degree or a master's or anything like that. But some kind of training program or real registered apprenticeship I gotta say, will get you so far ahead of versus somebody who doesn't do it. So I went to the Center for Agriculture and Sustainable Food Systems. From there, I wanted to go, because before that, a long time, I wanted to go to Africa. Uh, so I didn't have a degree at all, um, but the Peace Corps let me in, even though they usually have a four-year degree requirement because I did this six months training program and they needed people who want to do agricultural stuff. So there I am and that kid is clearly trying to steal my sunglasses. Uh, had a great time there, uh, eventually came back and ended up in Sebastopol, California where I kind of started my, I had my education, a little bit of experience just from dealing with farming out in Africa um, and then I ended up getting into farm management. So next slide. Uh, started out in Sebastopol, where I did uh, a place called a French Garden Farm, just as a farm manager, uh, where I, you know, I think I got paid 17 or 18 bucks an hour, uh, just kind of managing operations. Did that for about 11 months, and then my wife and I, that's when my wife and I really started having a real relationship, and we started after knowing each other about th three months, well, after hanging out for three months, we eventually started uh, Shooting Star CSA, and there it is. Uh, Basically, we found a nice flat land uh, that had access to water, good soil, and more importantly than anything is access to a road that led to markets. We we're close to I-80, which kind of led us into, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Bay Area, but it's kind of like a super metropolis uh, connected by highways and, and, and roads that the way I see it, it, the Bay Area as well as San Francisco, San Francisco is kind of like an island where people have a lot of money where they can't farm or produce any of their own vegetables. Uh, so it's a great place to extract money and put resources into. Uh, and so as you can see, we did a drip irrigation. Uh, we ended up in Certified Organic Magazine. Next slide. I also try to make it maintain a work-life balance. Uh, when it comes to, now we're talking about becoming an agricultural employee, but I think this totally applies. Uh, if you don't, especially veterans, and we all, most of us have some kind of PTSD issues, let's be real about it. Even those who didn't officially deploy, uh, getting yelled at sucks. Uh, it, it hurts, you know what I mean? Uh, so we all have things that we deal with from those times, um, and we all have to regulate that through stress reduction techniques. Uh, so I try to maintain work-life balance. Uh, you know, winter camping trips were kind of the way I did it, plus a, a lot of running, a lot of working out, uh, clearly not as much as I should. Uh, but yeah, work-life balance is absolutely essential, and your business and your job honestly has to be there to serve you. If your business or job does not serve you, then you really can't do your best at that job. Uh, next slide. So in the meantime, um, kind of when I was doing the Shooting Star CSA, uh, ended up doing night school at University of Phoenix, got an undergrad in business management, 
then went on to do part-time at UC Davis to get a, a, a master's in international agricultural development. Uh, I did that because what I wanted to do, and it's really been serving me lately, is develop my hard skills, such as tractor driving, weeding, you know, doing all the hard skills, understanding how to actually produce vegetables um, and g agriculture in general, and also work on the soft skills, such as, you know, PowerPoints, which clearly I didn't put that much time into, and um, Excel spreadsheets, projections, learning how to do all this stuff. You can't just go hard skills and be like, I'm a farmer these days. You can't just say, I'm a farmer and that's it. Uh, and stay ahead of the game in the next 20 years. You've got to develop your soft skills as well. Uh, and you have to know where you're going. And that's why I'm really big on numbers. I'm really big on using Excel. Uh, and it's really easy if you learn how to format your numbers to find out what direction you're going, whether at your current trajectory, you're going to become more profitable or less profitable. And those skills are extremely useful when walking into another farm or business that you bring those to the table and say, hey, Look, over the next five years, we're losing this much of our net. We have to make a change. Either we have to get a new piece of equipment that makes things more efficient, uh, we have to get rid of people, or hire more people. Uh, so bringing those skills onto larger organizational organizations are extremely useful to people. Um, and that's why the hard skills and the soft skills. Uh, this is in uh, Domin Dominican Republic. Uh, one of my kind of hobby things, I got into soil testing. Uh, so. We basically just, uh, Farmer to Farmer, uh, which is a USAID program, uh, sent me through an other organization through, called Partners in Americas, blah, 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 blah. I was in the Dominican Republic, and I did soil tests for people. Uh, main thing, people don't have a lot of access to soil tests out there. Um, and the main people that are doing soil tests are companies that are selling fertilizers uh, to farmers. And I'm not saying there's a conflict of interest because I, I actually believe that fertilizer companies do want us to be successful as farmers. They need to be to have, you know, successful, a successful business. However, it does get a little shady. Um, so I did my own test, found out that people were applying way too much phosphorus, an unnecessary amount of phosphorus. Um, potassium and nitrogen, they were kind of getting it just right, uh, but they had phosphorus, uh, not toxicity, but close to toxic levels. So I said, hey, you can adjust your fertilizer inputs, probably save a little money for a few years without putting more phosphorus in. And that was a trend across, I think I tested 40, 40 farms out there in two weeks. Next slide. All right, that's, uh, that's in Ethiopia. Uh, I also got into uh, drip irrigation projects. Uh, did drip irrigation projects, in, and these were sh short two-week assignments in uh, Ethiopia and uh, Senegal. And so that was a pretty fun kind of thing to do. Uh, this was, uh, I guess, where, what is it? Forgive me, I'm from California. Where do nuns live? What's that called? Convent. Convent. A convent. There it is, there it is. So there were a lot of nuns there. Uh, and that was, that was pretty cool because I felt kind of righteous uh, helping them out. And Ethiopia is a totally cool place. That's, it's one of the most hip, rocking places I've ever been in my life, so um, yeah. So this is just a gravity-fed thing. You see, toward the end of the wall, we, we just got that drum. Um, pretty much mostly sourced with uh, local things. What was interesting was these were drip irrigation kits, kind of like you know, a little box-sized kit uh, that Cirrus didn't. They asked me if they wanted, if I wanted to test a few and borrow a few to test them out on uh, on uh, farms. So I said, okay. I show up to their warehouse. And they literally have a warehouse with probably a thousand of these kits that they didn't even know, know about. Um, so I came back, you know, I set up for about 15 farmers, uh, and then I came back to the CRS bigwigs, uh, and, and I said, hey, look, you guys have a thousand of these. And they built a whole new project just on getting these materials out. So it was just interesting little logistical these little things hold, hold projects back, and it just sometimes just takes eyes on to get them going. Next slide. Oh, okay, there's more Ethiopia. Next slide. Okay, oh yeah, so we also did uh, the soil tests that people read that, that people were doing. Uh, it's all really tiny writing, uh, and a lot of people speak a local language anyway, and they, sp like, for Niger, everybody speaks Zarma or Hausa. Uh, and and there's, everything's written in French. So I kind of developed a, a language, that's kind of the thing I did with a language neutral uh, soil test, uh, kind of an instructional manual. And I went to, told my friends that were going to Nepal, I was like, hey, find me some illiterate people to try to test these things out to see if they can figure out the directions. So, and 
next slide. And there's a, me and a couple, my friend from Cambodia and stuff. We, this is when we were developing it, and don't worry about that other picture. Next slide. <laughs> and, there, and, go, and there's the illiterate people. And I'm like, look, Johnny, <laughs> these people don't look illiterate at all. Uh, How did I get that photo? Johnny took it. Uh, so a friend of mine who I was going to school with went to Nepal, took the photo of people working. Is that a common photo? Have you been seeing it oh, other places? I, I'm here. I'm there. You're there? I'm like, right? You remember, you saw the soil test system. You were there for it. You saw the pictures. Did you see the pictures? This is a nursery. This is an nursery. Yeah, that's sorry. Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Anyways, so so those pictures were my were my project, uh, my UC Davis project. I don't think she's illiterate. I mean, I don't want to be like. Prejudice against people with glasses or whatever. Yeah, I was like, unless she's out to kill bugs, she's not illiterate. Uh, bad joke. Um, anyways, so next slide. <laughs> so the last year, I ended up, uh, I, I worked for the, the Farmer Veteran Coalition for a while as a director of uh, training and education. Uh, trying to get, and I got a, uh, worked for you, I got a couple of veterans in the apprentice program, and they're, they're doing really good. I mean, they got themselves into, I just kind of helped facilitate a little bit, uh, and they're, they're really excited, they're doing great, but uh, I got offered this job, and I realized one thing that's really limited, um, really lacking in the overall agricultural sector, I'm talking organic and conventional, is farm manager positions are extremely, like, like they're short-staffed, on people who are willing to do work uh, and are educated enough. No, I say educated enough. There's just a certain set of aptitudes uh, for being a farm manager on a medium to large scale operations. And I will say it almost plays directly into military skills, um, way more than any kind of agricultural skills. Uh, so I got picked up for, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you because we're talking about farming the paycheck. Uh, I picked up for 90k a year plus a house, um, and they and my they hooked my wife up with a job to up in Oregon, um, and just to give you an idea of how desperate people are for people in that farm manager level. Uh, and I ended up doing uh, a combination of field crops and hazelnuts. I don't have any pictures of hazelnuts there, uh, and so I did a year out there, learned a ton. Um, but when it came down to it, uh, Lily wanted, uh, no, it's not Lily, I wanted to live in California and pursue, a, a, have a little more time to pursue hobbies because it became a, it was a seven days, seven day a week job for, for most of it. And, uh, and so we'll go into later on uh, how to step out of a job that is not working or if you find something better because as employees, this is a secret about us being employees, we don't have to be quite as mature as farm owners and business owners, okay? When you choose to be an employee, you're kind of a free agent. For instance, this job, if I did not show up to work every day or I was not doing my job, then they would kick me to the curb and I would not complain about it uh, because if I knew I wasn't doing my job, then okay, you know, I'm gonna leave. The inverse is also true, right? about if the job is not working for you, uh, or if there's things you do not agree on, you are not locked in forever when you take a job uh, as an employee. Now there's a right and wrong way to do it. I'll just, I'm, I'm just gonna go, go for it. Uh, give me one second, you're good, okay. So there's a right way and wrong way to leave a job that you have farming, especially in the management position. The golden rule taught to me by Michael O'Gorman, who has spent many, many years exactly in this realm of farm management, is you don't ever leave a farm in the middle of a season. And I would go on to extrapolate and say that an agricultural season is like a year-long landscaping job, okay? If you, you do not walk out on the middle. So just because of, I'd say, creative differences uh, on the way that 
uh, the farm functioned that I prefer to, you know, I had creative differences with the owner. Uh, when I see creative, I mean the way operations happen, I like to create order and have the space to create order within an operation. Uh, I believe order and harmony go hand in hand, uh, which is part of my military. Now, I don't believe in order just for the sake of order. I believe in order for the sake of harmony between people. When people don't know what's going on, the first thing they do is eat, eat, bite each other's throats. So I want to be more of a creative or, or of order than say somebody who walks people off the cliff and say, hey, just hang out a little bit later, longer, it'll get better, that kind of thing. So off my soapbox of that, I waited to, in terms of leaving, I was very clear with my intentions, but I also waited to the point where they were not going to carry me even one second longer than they needed to in the winter uh, because it was a pretty high, high salary. So I made as much money for this particular farm as possible I put in my two weeks at the end of harvest, and I also wrote a comprehensive report detailing all the things in the season that went well, all the things in the season that didn't go well. Um, and I also said that I would definitely be on the lookout for somebody who might operate better within their environment. Um, and so that's why, that's how I left. Uh, and because of my background, because I went ahead and got a master's degree and did all that stuff, I'm at the point where I can leave a job and I'm not worried about it, you know? And that's kind of an important thing. And that's, to me, that's when it comes to getting um, more options in agriculture. The way you do it is you build your skills, build your education, build your resume, and when, at the end of the day, have something to say about your experiences. Uh, and that's what I'd like for each and one of you, each and every one of you to do as you go forward within your agricultural careers. And that's it. Thank you, Matt. Matt's an Army vet, and uh, Adam is as well. Thanks, Lance. Oh, you missed a picture of a cat. <laughs> Mr. Silva. Can we get the story behind that cat? Uh, I'm just kidding. You'll keep talking. Ah. <laughs> Army guys love to talk, what can I say? Um, my name's Adam Sabrin, and uh, as the last panelist, I'll try to make it pretty quick. Um, I live and work in California, Central California. Any other California folks in the room? All right, got a few. Um, I do water. Our family business does water. Anything having to do with water. It's from the aquifer to the root. Um, we do deep well pumps. Uh, drip systems, pipelines, standpipes, all kinds of stuff, anything with water. So my personal background, um, I'm from Hanford originally, went to, uh, had the amazing opportunity to go to the United States Military Academy at West Point for four years. Uh, some people say it's a quarter million dollar education shoved right up your nose a nickel at a time, uh, except they don't say nose usually. Um, so after graduating from West Point in 2002, um, of course, 9-11 hit my senior first year. Saw the smoke coming up from the Twin Towers down in the city. Uh, watched for our stage, got my diploma from President Bush, and then shipped off to flight school at Fort Rucker, Alabama. Uh, I was at Fort Rucker, Alabama for about a year and two months, uh, which means that I missed the invasion of Iraq. So all my classmates were on the invasion, and I was still learning how to fly the Black Hawk. So next slide. Uh, for those of you who have never seen a Black Hawk, uh, the picture on the right is the hydraulic deck of the Black Hawk. Uh, we have three sets of primary and secondary servos. We have three hydraulic pumps, each performing uh, their own pressurization of different hydraulic systems. Some of them are redundant with other systems and some of them are not. So you have a primary, a secondary, and a backup pump. But hydraulic fluid at 3,000 PSI has the same characteristics as water at 40. You have pressures, you have flows, you have differentials. Um, you have clogged filters, you have uh, leaks. What do you do when you have a leak in the air because a bullet went through uh, one of the lines and you can't swedge it in flight? You have to isolate that system. Drip systems on farms work the exact same way. So when people say, well, how did you get into drip irrigation? I'd like to tell them this amazing story about hydraulics and a Blackhawk, but it was my brother-in-law who gave me a call and offered me a job. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, 
So yeah, no, uh, it, sometimes it's not you know, what you know, but it's who you know, and it's how we take our experience as veterans and apply it to other industries. And farming couldn't be more comprehensive when it comes to jack of all trades, master of none. The most successful farmers are the jack of all trades, and master of none. And so, um, yeah, there you go. So uh, deployed Iraq 2005, 2007, 2008, flew about 750 combat flight hours, everything from dropping soldiers off into battle uh, to picking up the, the, the dead uh, off the battlefield. And so I never have a bad day at work because I know I'm blessed and I'm lucky to be here, right? So uh, it's just a different um, outlook on how you treat your job. And agriculture can be stressful for sure. Um, so our company background, we started out in 1929. My brother-in-law's fourth generation owner of the business. Uh, the company started out just south of Fresno, California in a little town called Selma. And Lon Bennett uh, manufactured and installed concrete pipe, three foot joints at a time. Um, so laying concrete pipelines, uh, not long after, well, I should say a long time after, but after, uh, PVC pipe was invented. And so the company had to change from a manufacturing company to a contractor uh, role because making PVC is a lot harder than concrete, right? So we became a contractor, laying uh, uh, PVC pipe all over the valley, doing flood valve installations for dairies so that they could distribute their manure and effluent water. Um, and then in the early 80s, drip irrigation started to come on the scene, originating out of Israel. And so with every new shift in technology, the company had to stay up with the times and continue to, to learn and to develop. Uh, and now, today, from this iPad, I can actually control the drip irrigation systems on about 75 to 80 different farms throughout the state, uh, throughout the central San Joaquin Valley of California, right here in the palm of my hand. It's amazing. I can see their flows, I can see their pressures, and obviously if they have a mainline break, we can come fix it. It's like the OnStar of farming. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so um, California Ag Statistics, California produces 90, uh, actually it says right here, California is the sole producer of 99% or more of commodities in bold. I'll read them. Almonds, artichokes, figs, garlic, grapes, kiwi, peaches, melons, rice, seed, walnuts, and the list just keeps going on and on. So obviously, um, the ground in California is very valuable. The climate is good, the soil is good. It's a perfect storm of agriculture, and that's what leads to, to the uh, acreage uh, prices or the cost per acre to be somewhere between 20 and $22,000 an acre, right? 20 to $22,000 per acre, which is also why you don't see center pivot uh, irrigation in California because every square inch of that ground is so valuable. Um, so necessity is the mother of invention with drip irrigation and the, the, the cost of land and our severe droughts all led to innovation and our company stayed on the forefront of it. So drip irrigation systems are now seen as almost insurance policies as well as nutrient delivery systems. So I work with lots and lots of farmers and we don't sell drip systems. The, the conversation doesn't center around the drip system. The conversation centers around the value of the crop. How can we get a better crop with more yield on less water? And so when you start talking about the, micro uh, the micronutrient dosing uh, that goes into the flow of water that's going out into the field with our engineers getting to 95 to 96% in some cases distribution uniformity, which means every single plant or tree in that field gets the same exact amount of water within 6%. It also gets the same exact amount of nutrients within that field. So it's insurance for dry years, it's nutrition for wet years, and either way, uh, the drip systems have become much more valuable, and you're starting to see them spread into the Midwest, into the, your corn, soybeans, uh, cotton, alfalfa, uh, a lot of the prior, you know, low, what we call low value or commodity crops, because in your driest year, you can keep that crop going with a drip system. So it's almost like insurance. Um, two other things that I want to uh, hit on here uh, to close out my portion. Uh, you can see the pictures here as well. This is an alfalfa field with a dairy in the background. Before we planted the alfalfa, we ran the system to flush it out, and you can see all those little drippers 
can everybody see the little drops of water? It, it makes an irrigation mesh almost. And then that's the alfalfa field uh, taken, f that picture was taken from the dairy barns and this was the opposite side with the alfalfa growing. The uniformity is insane. Every single plant looks the same. Um, next slide. Uh, when we install it, we dig a trench on the end of the field and then connect risers into the tape after the tape has been injected with a tractor. And the picture on the right actually uh, shows a p uh, piece of drip tape that's about 12 to 13 inches underground. And you can see the dripper uh, right there in the hole. And so those tapes are spaced on tomatoes with crop spacing, you know, sometimes 60, 80 inches. On forage crops, they come tight as 30 inches, uh, one tape to the next. Um, I make it a habit to hire other veterans. And the reason for that is that as our business grew, I knew the only people that I could depend on were people who spoke my language, people who understood the, what the mission entailed, people who understood the, the difficulty in getting the mission accomplished but didn't call me with complaints or with, with problems. They call me with solutions. So I've got a, another fellow Black Hawk pilot who graduated Fresno State, runs my Lemoore division uh, in Central California. And uh, we recently picked up a 40,000 acre uh, contract on the island of Maui to, uh, for uh, development to put the island into diversified ag. 20 of that'll go into grazing, 20 of that'll go into citrus, mac nuts, avocados, and all kinds of other crops to make the islands more sustainable. And I couldn't accomplish a mission such as developing a 20,000 acre uh, farm in the middle of the ocean unless I had good people doing it. So the guy who's leading that operation for me right now is a Green Beret out of Fort Carson. He didn't know anything about water. But I knew that I could count on him to get in there with the grower and help them with their crop plan, help them to interface with our engineers and get them the right information that they need to do the hydraulic design for the, for the uh, job. So hiring veterans is a big deal for me. Um, and then finally, one of the things that uh, a lot of you guys may not have heard about that's kind of originated out of California is an initiative called My Job Depends on Ag. Uh, has anybody heard of the My Job Depends on Ag? One? Okay. Um, I encourage you to look it up after this conference or tonight. Uh, the My Job Depends on Ag initiative is a very, uh, it, it's gaining a lot of momentum. Uh, and the, the logic behind the My Job Depends on Ag um, uh, organization is to basically show the nation how many uh, of our working people, not just farmers, depend on ag. So they sell stickers as part of this uh, initiative. So it'll say, my job depends on ag. It'll have your, your state in the background, or it'll have the nation in the background. But you see them all over the California uh, landscape now, because every single person almost that is in the San Joaquin Valley, their job depends on ag whether they're crop insurance or they're banking from Credit West, uh, they sell tractors, they sell, um, even the porta potty guys are driving around with this My Job Depends on Ag sticker uh, on their truck. Uh, and so it's really starting to spread and they're doing, they've done a, a, a TV, um, a PBS, public broadcasting system, um, uh, kind of a, a, a series, it's, I think it's on like the fourth show or something now, talking about, you know, being a farmer today, what is it like? It talks about the water struggles. It talks about the, the, the fact that, you know, all of our farmers are having to do so much more with so much less nowadays. So anyways, that organization conti continues to pick up steam. I would just encourage you to take a look at what they're doing with, with advocacy for agriculture and all the supporting functions that support those farms. So with that being said, I'll hand off the mic. Well, there is one more presenter, me, so I'm a moderator and presenter both. Matt? Going the wrong direction? No. Hi, there, there I am. There he is. Next one. Next slide. My ag journey, I, my dad was in the plastic bag business. I did not grow up in agriculture. I needed a job, and my, my got out of high school, went to work for a farm, this is 1965. As before GPS, before air conditioned cabs, I didn't even rate an umbrella. The heavy tillage in California in those days was done with a crawler. Next. That's Lance Corporal Monaco shaking hands with a heavy brass back in about 1969, I think. Next. Uh, work history. I've been an agricultural banker all my life. Uh, we're going to talk about farm credit in a second because you need to know about it. But I spent 14 years of, well, it's, it's all up there. I retired from Farm Credit West on December 31st, 2014. But I continue working for Farm Credit West under contract. I teach our young managers leadership skills. Guess where I got all that background? Military. And I'm also a veteran coordinator, so they help subsidize my 
I work at a discounted rate for a former veteran. Uh, Michael said this morning how I help them with their administrative functions. I'm going to talk about farm credit a minute, and I don't want anybody's eyes to glaze over here. There's going to be a test. But uh, if you're going to live and work in rural America, you need to understand what farm credit is. And uh, We'll get through this real quick. But farm credit's a nationwide system of 70 banks organized to provide financing and financial services to the agriculture industry in rural America. These 70 banks are owned independently, but they're organized as farmer-owned cooperatives, if you know what that is. They're owned by the farmers and ranchers who use their services, just like a credit union. Other well-known farmer-owned cooperatives are like Sun-Made Raisins, Ocean Spray, Cambrai products. Those are owned by the farmers who sell their products to them. Farmer -owned, farm credit's been over 100 years of experience. If you're not in agriculture, nobody knows who we are. We dominate the industry. Next. Farm credit has strong ties to FEC. For its 10-year history, farm credit has been a consistent major financial supporter of the Farmer Veteran Coalition. Financial support from headquarters has been strong and consistent. Local level as well. Several uh, local associations scholarship attendees to this conference. Gary Madison, who you were introduced to at lunchtime, the chairman of the board of directors for F Farmer Veteran Coalition, the senior vice president for Farm Credit in Washington. And we said local involvement of state chapters. Next. Uh, farm credit financing, they provide fi all types of financing to agriculture, short-term loans for an animal production, crop production, intermediate-term loans for livestock, irrigation systems, long-term loans for vineyards or facilities or whatever, land acquisition. Next. Many associations throughout the country also provide crop insurance, accounting and bookkeeping services, business planning, appraisal services, succession planning. And I want to say one thing here, you see a bookkeeping <coughs> services. In 40, 50 years in this business, there are never enough good bookkeepers in this industry. If you have any interest at all in this subject, you can make a lot of money. And farm credit customers are all types of farmers, row crops, field crops, livestock operators, commercial fishermen, timber owners, contract loggers, farm-related businesses, and rural homeowners. A lot of these associations provide rural home loans. Next. Careers in Ag Financing and Services, Relationship Manager, which this is the, the person who goes out and meets with customers, organizes their, gives them their guidance, organizes their financial services that they need. Appraisal, that's evaluating the land, if you have any interest in that. These guys work outside pretty much all the time. What's that orchard worth? What's that dairy worth? Chattel Inspector, that's somebody who inspects cattle and equipment. Financial Analyst. There's the guys that crunch the numbers, legal and accounting, of course, in crop insurance, succession planning. Next. That's the best part of the job. I, I tell you, I love my job. I did it for 50 years, and I loved it. That's the old, I'm the old guy on the left talking to a couple of farmers, finishing up their rice harvesters. He's got the farmer profile with that gut hanging out there. <laughs> but these are two young guys. Well, they're late 40s. They're great farmers that didn't understand the business aspect. So when I retired, they asked me to help them out to learn the business. And that's, you know, we're all mission-oriented here. That was one of my missions, was I was going to teach my farmers everything I could to keep them from going broke. Because I, I was in this business in the 80s. If any of you have ever heard that, the 1980s for farming was like the Great Depression. Half the farmers in this country went out of business over a 10-year period. Next. Now I'm going to shift gears a bit. But you as a veteran have much to offer. I've worked with a lot of young veterans trying to help them get work. You're, I'm just interested, this is interesting to me, but your fellow Americans are in awe of you. You guys all, I mean all of us here, raised our right hand. You stepped off in the unknown. They just can't believe you did that. Your life isn't your own. It's like uh, they, what Matt has said, it's a blank check. You guys did it. Your fellow Americans are also wary of you a bit. If I hire this veteran, is he going to make a stand at attention in the morning? or Because they don't know. But you need to be wary of both of these things. You can use it in all part, but be wary of the overbearing part. Next. Okay, this is a picture besides two fat old men. 
I'm the short guy on the right. The guy on the left is Dan. Dan and I have been best friends since the seventh grade. There's a reason I'm showing you this picture. Dan is also a Marine veteran. He also chooses to serve most of his customers are agricultural. He does succession planning, life insurance, estate planning. About 30 years ago, we realized we had a lot of the same customers. In fact, here we are in a small town on the coast of California, meeting a timber owner that we both do business with. Why am I telling you all this? Both these guys were $69 a month E1 privates at one point in the Marine Corps. Okay, and we both made it, we both contributed, we both had, we built our camaraderie together, we get together, we travel together, and it's just been a great, great relationship. And there's one other reason. Dan's a double amputee. You never know it, and he hasn't slowed him down one bit. Next. <coughs> Again, you as a veteran have much to offer. Even if you have an infantry MOS, and neither Dan and I had any kind of business in the Marine Corps, we, all, we were grunts, basically. Even if you had an infantry MOS, you bring valuable experience and characteristics to the table, such as commitment, leadership skills, perseverance, dedication to mission. These aren't found in the civilian world. I can't tell you that's the biggest disappointment in my life. Leadership in the civilian business world is terrible. Banking is terrible. You know, you get to the top in, in the civilian world by being a good teacher, you become a principal, a good banker, you become a president and stuff. And then, you, then you think you know it all and you never had one bit of leadership training. You guys learn more when your first five minutes stand on the yellow footprints at boot camp. Oh, you're the glasses guy. Yeah, sorry. That's okay. We're glad we hung on to him. <laughs> um, Okay, you as a veteran have much to offer. Okay, next. I've got some materials here for you. There's some in the back and some here. All three of them can help you. The two published ones, it's a Veteran Careers and Agriculture Resource Guide on the left and a Career Assessment Workbook on the right. They're kind of dated, but I had some printed up here. There's here and there. Uh, these can help you civilianize your resume. Gives you a lot of ideas. Again, they're dated, they're five years old, but don't worry about that. Give you ideas for jobs. And the center thing is something I put together in about 10 minutes one evening, just potential jobs in agriculture. I mean, there's a, I love my job and I didn't farm. I got to work in agriculture, I was outside, I was a white collar coat and tie job, I got to wear blue jeans most of the time. Next. So some, just a couple of heads up. Civilianize your resume. If you're deciding to go for a career in agriculture or get a job, civilianize your resume. Take the acronyms out of there. It's okay to talk about what you did, but just make sure it's not off-putting to somebody who doesn't know what, they're, what, what it means. Yes, sir, no, sir, aye, aye, sir. I've been in interviews with guys, and it's like, man, they, they get nervous and they fall back on the eye. You know, it's almost overbearing. Be careful of that. I don't know if the Marine Corps still teaches this, but they used to say if you... When you confront a situation, you confront it, you adapt to it, you overcome it. It's the same what you're at right now. You, got a, you guys are out of the service. I want a career. How do I, what do I, I yeah, I got a problem. I got to figure this out. How are you going to adapt? What are you going to do? Where are you going to go get training? And how are you going to overcome it? Next. This stuff I teach to all my young people I've mentored over the years. It's up to you to create the value that you bring to your job. I don't care where it is, but it's up to you. It's not to somebody else. You can't whine about it. But it's up to you to create your value. It's up to you to manage the perception that others have of you. Man, I, when I first got in the work world, I had a chip on my shoulder, and boy, that, that showed, and I, I had no idea. Create your image. Man, it's somewhat similar to manage perception. Who do you want to be? Who do you want to represent? My thing is, I'm a Marine, I'm proud of it. I didn't do yes sir, no sir, but I want people to feel like, yeah, that guy's a Marine, man. I think you know all you veterans feel the same way. Build a talent stack, this is another concept. Rather than being an expert at one thing, create a stack of talents that you're good at. It makes you more valuable. Be good at them. Confidence. What are you, I mean, you guys, you're veterans, man. You're not some pencil neck that just went to college. Build your own camaraderie. That's what, like what I've done with my buddy Dan. I've done that everywhere I went. Because camaraderie and sense of mission, that's the biggest thing I missed when I got out. That was a long time ago, and I've brought that to every job I had. Sometimes it was not appreciated. Many times it's not appreciated, but it got me by. 
and cr the mission, create a mission. I did mine, again, as I said, I, I went through the 80s and people lost their farm. I, I, I spent the next 40, 30 years teaching people how to manage their finances. If they didn't like what I told them, they could go across the street and borrow from somebody else. Not one person went out of business under my watch after that. Next. And I'm going to do question and answers here now. I want you to understand something. All of us here are veterans. Everything here is a no, no stupid questions. You've got to trust us all. So you can direct your questions at any of these individuals, including me, as you want. But I'm going to leave this right up here on the table. Well, first of all, does anybody have any questions? Adam, I'm going to ask you one right off the bat. In your business, what kind of jobs would be available for, for veterans, you think? I have an Army sniper who does job analysis and billing. Um, if you're a Navy CB, I've got a spot for you. <laughs> uh, many of the job advertisements that I do, um, I do st try to put stuff like that in there, uh, simply because, you know, from a higher level, what's really interesting is that uh, a lot of the farms that I and my colleagues work with when you see how the organization is actually structured, you realize just how smart the Army has been over the last 200 years of revisions with respect to how it organizes itself. So if you were to take an Army battalion and structure a farm just like an Army battalion, you'd be cooking with fire because the farm owner would be the battalion commander. You got an S1 personnel section, okay, HR, S2, your S2 military intelligence functions would be the horticulturalist, all your crop advisors, your PCAs, you know, all the people who are doing intel for your farm. S3, the operations staff member, crop planning, crop transportation planning, this follow-on sales of the crop, the preliminary work that has to be done to procure, you know, or to, to do the planting for seeds uh, or saplings if you're going to plant trees. So that's all operations and planning. That's a staff position. And then, of course, the S4 function, which is supply um, uh, and, and logistics, right? So the S4 cell could be doing parts procurement from tractor for tractors all the way up to, you know, anything having to do, to do with the logistics of getting the crop to market. Um, and so, and then you have area managers, if your farm's big enough, who own the terrain. So they would be like the company commanders. Uh, so if you were to set up a farm exactly like an infantry battalion in the army, I mean, you'd be set up for success. It's pretty simple. You know, every, everything that you looked around and learned in the military as far as org structure, directly applicable. Um, other jobs that I hire uh, military type folks for, you know, are machine operators, mechanics. We got big wheel trenchers. Uh, we got small chain diggers. We've got, um, hell, we've got engineers who actually engineer the drip system. So if you have a background in civil engineering, we could train you on IRICAD, which is the irrigation specific form of CAD. Um, so any discipline really would have a spot in my organization. Well, the farmer-owned cooperatives are run across the board for their cooperatives that provide farm supplies, uh, some of them for marketing like Ocean Spray, like I Sun Made Rays, Sun Sweet Prunes, Sun Kissed Oranges, all that, those are all owned by the farmers who sell to them. Uh, farm Credit's, of course, the bank supplier. Uh, there are others. Uh, farm Credit also does supply financing to other cooperatives, like Farm Credit finances Farmers Rice Cooperative. I mean, it's the biggest rice pr processor in California. Does that answer your question? Kind of.
Yeah. Well, the cooperative movement's pretty good. I'm, it, you need, I mean, without farm credit in the marketplace, it'd be dominated by Bank of America and Wells Fargo, and what incentive would they have to cut rates if it wasn't for us? Who, who, when we make t excess profits, we return it to the customer, to our owners, the farmers. I mean, you guys got big checks once a year. What would the big banks do if we weren't in the business? The same way with the tomato processing industry, where a, there's a cooperative that dominates. Yes, sir. Well, um, just follow that question. Like, so, uh, I mean, I got a farm credit Virginia, or farm credit is great, I love them. But how would you actually finance a cooperative? So, like, I have a piece of kit that I want to buy or that I need, and I can't justify the expense, but if I pool with a bunch of guys who all need the same piece of kit, we can then maybe secure funding for it. So it's actually, how do you fund a cooperative so that I can then team with my, you know, my network? And then we can afford that piece of you know, I, probably we'd want you to just start form a partnership or something to start with. And oh yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, yeah, I don't want to ask, answer for them. So cooperatives do have access to traditional debt and equity vehicles. Um, so the the difference would be if you have a startup cooperative that has, let's say, five members. You have five member farmers. Um, that is an entity that can take out additional um, debt vehicles. Just just like if I was my personal farm business that was taking out a loan, um, that's something you can do. Um, a couple resources, CoBank uh, is the parent of farm credit. Um, they specifically lend to farm cooperatives. Um, they have a great program called Co-op Start that is for starting new agricultural cooperatives. Um, so that's a great resource. Uh, the Ohio State University has a center for cooperatives that helps develop new and emerging cooperatives for farmers. So we've seen a lot of interest in marketing cooperatives specifically um, with produce farmers and also some livestock farmers in Ohio. So the Ohio State University Center for Cooperatives would be a great a resource for you. Um, there is an educational component that they created in the center called Co-op Mastery. It's an online educational course for folks that are looking to start a cooperative. There is a finance module within that where we have um, Gary Wiederborn, I believe was his last name. He is uh, with CoBank and he walks through cooperative balance sheets. Um, we talk about cooperative equity uh, within that. So that's a great way to get an overall view of how you finance a cooperative. Yes, ma'am. I don't know the exact details of, I guess, your school you're trying to set up. Uh, and what I've seen so far, I've been most excited about apprenticeships uh, and maybe creating your own apprenticeship, and we can talk later about that. Yeah, I think the, the answer is all the above. Um, there, there's lots of different ways to, to actually do it. And, you know, some people start out at the ground level in a company that's in the ag sector and they learn through osmosis and, and experience. Um, you know, I didn't know a thing about irrigation when I started at the company and you just learn by doing, you know, so that's one aspect of things just to secure a job in, a se in the sector. Um, the other thing is, is that to, to be honest with you, a lot, a lot of farms, um, even large family farms are always looking for help. They're always looking for good help. And so it boils down to initiative. Um, farmers are, are typically impressed by somebody who comes in and turns in a resume or, a, or an application. They made the effort to go out to the farm 
and and make themselves known. Um, so of course, the in California we have the UC uh, system. We have you know they, they call California Polytechnic uh, University. Um, they call it the farm school. You know it's. Just that, that school itself is just known for its agricultural program. Um, and even if you're not going to get a degree in something ag-related, they have all kinds of workshops and, and side classes and stuff that could get you connected. So obviously the college network is another way. Yeah. Yeah, I know how you feel. I mean, in my cert, it, no, you're not alone. You're not alone. And, and I'm not going to sit here and pretend to have a solution because I don't, but I have felt that pain. You know, when I wanted to hire, I, I knew that I wanted to hire Green Beret specifically for this job in Maui because the farming operation, you know, is a large corporate farm and they lack structure and they lack a lot. I mean, just, I don't want to talk about bad about my client, but they're just very disorganized. And so I knew that if I hired a guy who was a professional at going into, you know, foreign situations and being able to <laughs> infiltrate and then train and advise and assist, that's the Green Beret mission. So I actually found a charity called Your Grateful Nation that specializes in placing operators into jobs coming out of active duty. So it's very disjointed. And, and I know what you're saying. It's, it feels very disjointed because there's so many uh, organizations out there that do this. Um, and to be honest with you, I was going to talk to Len about this at some point uh, tomorrow, tonight, tomorrow, or the next day. But I think that as this organization grows, we don't necessarily need a job board. But I think if the Farmer Veteran Coalition built an opportunity board for opportunities just like that, that maybe it's not a job, and that's okay. We're not looking for a job board per se. I mean, it can have jobs on it, but really it's an opportunity board. And, and you could have all kinds of different opportunities on it, like what you have, you know, where it's not a full-time job, but hey, this opportunity offers all these other, you know, good things. Right. Right. And so somebody might benefit and how we can help them so they can come to conferences like this and talk to people mm -hmm. like and, and maybe they're coming out of a rehab program. Maybe, maybe they have just figured out how to clean up, you know, their, their prior life and, and get clean or whatever. Look, I mean, at the end of the day, all, you know, a lot of us came home with PTSD. I was drinking way too much, had to learn how to stop drinking. Don't drink anymore. Now I'm of greater value. But I was fortunate in that I didn't ruin my whole life prior to making that decision. A lot of these guys and girls have. So the opportunity board, you could say there are some opportunities that would be more um, accepting of someone who's trying to get their life restarted again, and whether they got in trouble or not. But yeah. Boy, I got a lot of hands up. Right. That's awesome. Absolutely, that's cool. It's a win-win. I think just to to go back into what you're looking, as far as I could understand, you have a program that you want, and on your farm. You want veterans to be there, and you want to figure out some kind of apprenticeship program uh, with them. Have you? 
talked about have you gone to your local community college and engaged with uh, veteran student groups, veteran horticulture clubs, anything like that? We haven't yet. I know, you know a couple of U of M, had, University of Minnesota has a great extension program, and it's something that we, we need to further investigate. And I'm not trying to say somebody do the work for me. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just helpful to kind of find a, a quicker route to what we're looking for because it's so much time invested in research and so. I, I would also recommend a consultant. Mm -hmm. If you can find a good consultant, even if they're not nearby you, but they have experience in ag and in perhaps prior service, I, that's a great project for a consultant to pull together for you to say, hey, what are my pipelines? What are those pipelines? What are those funnels? And, and build that knowledge base. I think that'd be a great project. <laughs> Yes, you've been very patient. You've been patient. Um, I was going to suggest VJO. I'm also going to suggest the PRRCs within the VA. And then also there is um, Job and Family Services. They have a veteran specifically hired to hire other veterans. Um, so it's an, a veteran employment specialist. And then we also, within most VAs, have a veteran employment specialist. Um, and if you also connect with a peer specialist, which is what I am, um, you will get a lot of uh, internal like connections because that's what our job is, is to connect veterans with um, inside and outside of the VA. So to make sure that we're all talking to each other. We have so many people no. interested, but they just, you know, no bites. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we just have to find a point in. of contact within the VA system and someone that you can trust and then they can go and, you know, get more information for you. But we got more questions here. You guys can hook up afterwards. Just say yes, sir. I have a question for Matt and maybe for Anna. Um, it sounded like maybe you did some, uh, was that farmer to farmer volunteer program work that you did? That is correct. And then, so I'm, I'm curious uh, what those opportunities are under USAID and how long those uh, volunteer advisory positions usually last. For. Okay, so I did farmer to farmer in the Congo. In fact, it was through Farmer Veteran Coalition. I saw that Matt was doing it, and then that's why I did it. I know, it's a lot of stupid stuff. We've, known, we've actually known each other a lot longer than we think we do, even though we sort of met today. Um, yeah, so that is, Farmer to Farmer is an incredible program. Um, it's USAID, not USDA, but we there's so much overlap. Um, and they are they can be anywhere from I went to Congo for three weeks. Um, in fact, I was one of the last people there before they closed it for, I think, pretty obvious reasons. Um, but y there are several um, sort of would you call them boards? I guess the best way to find the the open positions. A lot of organizations have them because what you're actually doing is you're temporarily working for what we call the implementing partner, which might be, um, I went with ACDI VOCA, it might be World Vision, it might be, what did you do, Farming for the Americas? So just uh, break, break that. Yeah, but, but those opportunities, I cannot say enough how great they are. So Farmer to Farmer is like a fund. Think of it as a fund from USAID. Um, and there are multiple NGOs and nonprofits who want to take that money. And the way they get that money is by saying, hey, look, we're going to send somebody here for two weeks, usually it's two weeks, uh, a short-term assignment, a subject matter expert to this country to teach them this, and they have their own initiative programs. So you have Partners for the Americas, uh, Catholic Relief Services does it. Um, gosh, who's the, the butter people? Who are the butter people? Lando Lakes. Lakes has one. Yeah, and so there's all the different organizations. So really just Google Farmer to Farmer. Each one of these organizations has slightly different requirements. Windrock International, I feel like I got into Partners for the Americas before I got into Windrock International. Uh, I feel like I wasn't qualified until like they're the, yeah, yeah. the creme de la creme, yeah. except for Orlando Lakes, which is very crim, crimmy. Okay. Anyways. I can't talk about that. Yep. They're my, they're, they're so, two of my projects, yeah. and I love them, so I won't like, trash them. So I'm just going to say GTS. GTS, Google, that's... Yeah. Google it, uh, farmer to farmer, and you might have that relevant skills that they're looking for, but keep looking, uh, and you can talk to us about it too. Uh, here you go. Yes, sir. Hey, Max, I have a question for Matt. For, the, uh, for your big farm manager job, 
Before you took that job, what was the biggest, because I imagine if you're earning that, it must be a million dollar and gross farm. So, you're like, so what was the biggest farm before you did that to be able to walk in and manage a farm and make that much money? Okay. The biggest farm that I managed before that was a 15 acre vegetable farm. That's still pretty big. I mean, well, I think of things less in, in terms of uh, size of farm and more of income, like how much you grow. Like, so the 15 acre we managed to gross uh, around two hundred eighty to three hundred thousand dollars a year on it, right? So then you look at what's really interesting. Um, they look at larger farms, and it's just uh, it, it, it seems exponentially larger in terms of uh, the money that they earn. But at base. There is absolutely no difference between the problems that small farms have and the problems that large farms have. I'm talking down to the exact same problems with the tractors we have. They're just a little bit bigger. It actually, doing, doing small farming, I was so much more prepared for the large farm than I expected. Um, and so you're just doing a miniature version of it. The same problems. In some ways, you have more complicated problems with small farms. So that management that you're getting on your smaller farms, do not second guess it. Do not think, oh, am I just wasting my time? Are people going to respect this? The answer is if you're trying to get into larger farms through starting your own small farm, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for that. I think questions like, it, it's really hard to ask somebody what a, a, a question to get like an ethical answer out of something. Uh, like, what is your negotiational, uh, what is your philosophy during negotiations is probably, uh, and how do you feel about the nature of human beings in relation to your farm? Um, and those are questions that are really hard to ask, and those are questions that you can you only have to feel it out as you go. I would have probably said I would have put more uh, structure in my own schedule um, and just had more time off, and probably I would say I would have stood up for myself more in terms of saying, "Hey, I need to take this week off at this time." Uh, but when you get into a farm that's say undermanned which is the, the problem that all of these farms are having, every single person on that farm becomes unbelievably important just to get the operation to function. So you t like as a, as a manager, when I'm moving all of these pieces around, I take off for a week, I come back, and, and none of the things that I need to get done have gotten done in some cases because we were, in our case, we were so short on labor uh, that everybody got pulled to some, something else. And without that guiding kind of, uh, without that person to guide the priorities, uh, people just scatter in all different directions. It also has to do with, again, my philosophy. And you know, another question: What is your philosophy on order? And and uh, I think as military people, we like order not because we're we're, we're brainwashed or anything, but because it makes sense and uh, communication as well. So there was a lot of different factors that I didn't want to stick around to fix because I would have to change, you know, an entire culture, which is possible. But in my case, because I have not kind of an economics background, I decide how much effort something's worth, uh, how much time I'm going to put onto it, and what, basically, essentially, whether it's worth it economically and personally. And I decided that I wanted to move on. And, uh, and so, yeah. When I talk to real farm managers too at conferences, they make like thirty thousand dollars a year, and that's seven days a week. And like, so I'm like, They're clearly underselling themselves. It's a big part of it. Uh, people under people sell it as this great 
wonderful thing, which it is, and we sell it as therapy, which it is. Um, but people are, people are allowing, as long as people allow themselves to get underpaid uh, as an employer, as I was an employer back in my job, if somebody's going to work for $17 an hour, I'm sorry, I'm not going to turn around and pay him 25 um, So people have to demand more. It rains a lot out in Oregon. It's, it's, it's rough conditions. I earn the money. Um, yeah, yes, ma'am. Sure. So um, I'll speak on behalf of Ohio Farm Bureau. Each state has a Farm Bureau. Um, there's the American Farm Bureau Federation, which is a sponsor of this conference today. And then each state has a charter. So in Ohio, um, we're a grassroots advocacy organization. So we're there to work for you. Basically, I have thousands of bosses across the state of Ohio. And when a farmer comes to me saying, um, I have issues with taxation problems, um, with valuation of my property, that's why CAUV is what it is today. That's how we pass that legislation to benefit us on the taxation of our agricultural land. Um, another example from Ohio, uh, we have water quality. You've all probably heard about Lake Erie and the algae blooms and Lake Erie um, as an entity um, was able to um, pass, uh, some legislation was passed to prevent farmers from using fertilizer on their fields um, in certain ways and restrict uh, farmers' property rights on their own property. Um, the Farm Bureau went to advocate on behalf of farmers so they could, um, so they could responsibly apply fertilizer to their land. Um, so first and foremost, we're a grassroots advocacy organization. Um, some of those pictures in my PowerPoint were the additional benefits. So we call that icing on the cake in the Farm Bureau. Um, some other benefits that I've used personally, um, $500 off a case tractor, um, all of your choice hotel, and um, Ford trucks, uh, Caterpillar, big discounts on those kinds of extra benefits uh, through the Farm Bureau. Uh, we put on educational programming. So one thing that we are very passionate about is preparing the next generation of farmers. We talked about some of those extension and land grant university educational programs. We run marketing programs. So we have several small farms that whether they're looking to work together to market um, as a cooperative or they're looking to do direct sales, helping farmers um, learn how to do basic bookkeeping on their farms, pr providing those kind of educational workshops to our members at a, a very low discounted cost is something that we do in, in Ohio, and I'm sure in other county farm bureaus they do as well. No, no, we do. So in it's different depending on what state you're in. Um, we are uh, partners with Nationwide, which is the largest agribusiness um, producer. I actually have my, I'm branded a little bit Nationwide today, so we don't really see lines there in Ohio, but Nationwide is an agribusiness insurance producer. Uh, Farm Bureau members receive very deep discounts off of their insurance and liability policies with Nationwide. Um, personally, my farm saves about $700 a year on our farm liability insurance policy. So those are benefits of being a Farm Bureau member as well. How did you get your job? I mean, you're, you're a veteran, you've been to school, you're a farmer, but now you're an executive of the Farm Bureau. Right, so um, my path was not necessarily through agriculture. I had an agricultural background. I went to school for business, so I have a bachelor's degree in business administration. Um, then I went to study counseling uh, so I have a master's degree in counseling. I'm currently an MBA student at Ohio State University. I went back to business, left side of the brain as well. Um, all of those things and my background in agriculture really found the opportunity for me. So I knew, I think on my application for the Farm Bureau, I had all my references from the Farm Bureau. So I've been a big fan of the Farm Bureau and done a lot of um, uh, done a lot of work and kind of networking sessions with them in the past. Um, the question always comes up, is it who you know or what you know? And I believe it's who you know. Um, so that's one great thing about being at a conference like this today and meeting as many individuals as you can while you're here. Sometimes it's those contacts that find you a fantastic career in agriculture. Okay, it's 4.59. Okay, go ahead. Santa Cruz program 
you know, had a six month immersion program in ag? Or, is that enough? Most everybody in my office has almost no agricultural background at all. Now, that sounds a little crazy, but keep in mind that we are primarily project managers. I'm not out there running a dairy. What I'm doing is making sure that the money that your taxes paid is being properly managed by a nonprofit that is helping a dairy, that is helping a yogurt factory, that is helping a guy. So, and, and this is a big thing. When you, when you are civilianizing, is that what you call it? Civilianizing your resume. One of the biggest things that, that we short sell ourselves as military people is not understanding the degree to which we are project managers and have always been. Every mission can equate to a project. And I don't care if it's a movement of everybody going to, you know, whatever, the family, you know, family support group, whatever. That, that is a project. It has to be planned out. If you're a non-commissioned officer, you are a project manager. Really look at that from that perspective. Um, it's not just your, as, as he was saying, it's not your hard skills, it's your soft skills as well. So. Well, we, you know, I did have an agriculture background, and, and that did help, particularly um, as I had done engagement work with Farmer Veteran Coalition. What they were most interested in from my military background was ma managing these large international projects um, and being able to do that in environments that are not the most comfortable, that are not the most... Um, straightforward to work in, that, where things get complicated very quickly. Um, and those were the skills that the military really brought. Me being able to say, well, yes, I have <clears throat> run a project where you know, we were putting together the Baghdad Health Lab. And during that, we encountered these complications. And so when something like that comes up on a project for the USDA, most of them, as I said, they don't even crack my top 10 of crazy and terrible things that I've dealt with. So um, that's, that's the thing to emphasize in your resume. Not necessarily sort of um, the nuts and bolts of military experience, but the confidence that it gives you to operate in stressful circumstances, that experience of managing projects in stressful circumstances, of being able to respond to unexpected challenges and just not have it be a problem for you because you've done it. It's not a big deal. I just, I want to add to, to the question. Um, I am a USDA employee as well. I work for risk management agency. Most importantly, to find a job, you gotta go to usajobs.gov. Mm -hmm. And also, if you understand your special hiring authorities, uh, the US government has a law that if you have a, a, a disability at a 0% or more, or if you were discharged within the last three years, there's a special hiring authority where they can bypass the whole USA jobs process and they can do a direct non-competitive uh, hire. And not a lot of people know about that. I'm here, I, I'm here today for that. So I do have flyers here, if anybody, we are hiring. Um, I have my email address. And if you have any questions on special hiring authorities, I'm the one you want to talk to. I have templates on resumes. That's another uh, uh, fallout that uh, applicants, they fail to provide the right resume. Totally different from what you learn in school. It's not one page bullet style. We're talking about paragraphs, three, four pages is what they want to oh, see. Oh, interesting. So mm -hmm. if I have a flyer here, if you guys want one, um, shoot me an email and I'll send you a whole presentation on mm -hmm. veterans uh, hiring authorities. Thank you. And I call your attention to the uh, materials here. Please pick them up. I don't want to have to ship them back to California. And thanks a lot for all your uh, questions. Huh?